dear students and participants we are going to start with a new lecture of railway engineering the today's focus of this lecture will be ballast formation and the stresses in ballast formation in the previous lecture we talked about the track stresses and there the components which we have considered was rails and sleepers and within the rails the stresses were computed for different conditions like the eccentricity of the loading the lateral loading twisting effect the lateral deflection and the thermal effects in the case of today's lecture we will focusing on primarily three things one is the ballast and then the formation level which is provided bottom of the ballast and the another one is in the fish plates and the bolt holes which are used to connect the rails and finally we will also be talking about the dynamic overload so let us start with the ballast section the track stresses in the ballast section if we look at say a sleeper here then below this sleeper there is a ballast cushion being provided and this depth of the ballast cushion is already defined either on the basis of the loads which are coming or the spacing of the sleepers or the type of gauge which we are considering so this is the depth which we are taking for the ballast and then at the bottom is a formation level so we have the sleeper we have the ballast and then the formation level so the stresses which we are considering here is in the ballast section and what are the factors which are going to make a difference here that's what we are discussing the very first thing is the live load and the dad load of the superstructure and the trains this live load and dad load of the superstructure and the train will be there because of the load which comes through the rails so we have a rail section here as well as a rail section at the other side so whatever loads are coming so they are coming through that so this is also going to influence the stresses in the ballast another thing is the sleeper now if we talk about the sleeper the three things can happen one is that what type of sleeper and the material of sleeper which we are using here and on the basis of that the elastic properties of the sleeper will be there if you're talking about a concrete sleeper then we are considering the frictional strength or the compressive strength if you're talking about a wooden sleeper then the strength is going to be much different as compared to the concrete sleeper still we will be talking about the compressive strength there because the loads which are coming from the top but then the strength in terms of along the grains across the grains those are the things which will be there similarly the things will change in terms of the characteristics uh, or the strength properties for the ci sleepers or the steel truss sleepers then section and length of the sleeper what is this width say if uh, we consider it in a three dimensional condition so what is the width which we are considering here if we show it as b what is the height of this section what is the length of this sleeper this will define that what is the bearing area so this load from the rail is going to be distributed in this form and similarly here so when the load is going in this way then how much area is going to be covered so usually we consider that with respect to this center line one side of the load will be getting putting the influence in this l by 2 and the another side will be putting the effect in l by 2 so this bearing area which is l into b is uh, 
consideration uh, variable. <coughs> then another thing is spacing of the sleepers. If they are very near, you have made a very good packing which may or may not be required, then the stresses which are going to be down are lesser as compared to if we are putting it at a distance level. But at the same time, if you have placed this one sleeper and then this is another sleeper, the influence area of the load distribution that is also an important thing. So, if this distance is more, say if it is being provided some way here, so it may happen that the influence area or the overlap which will be there in terms of the stresses getting induced is very small and there are individual effects with respect to only p whereas in this case it is 2p. Then the another uh, variable is related to the ballast. So, what are the ballast issues? Very first thing the degree of compaction of the ballast. There should not be any looseness first of all. If it is a very compacted system then those uh, stresses they are going to be distributed in a very much better manner. If there are voids, if there is a problem with the compaction then under the load it will try to settle down, there will be rearrangement of the particles, there will be issue with respect to that. The nature of the ballast pad, what type of material is being used again here? We did talk about the various types of the materials which can be used in the ballast cushion and there also we discussed that there are some materials which can be used as a permanent section but there are some other materials which should be used as a temporary section. Later on they should be changed to the another material which is suitable for permanent section. So, that nature of ballast bad is also an important aspect. Size and gradation of the ballast. So, whatever the permissible values which are given in terms of uh, the gradation that you are talking about the say 40 mm size or you are talking about 20 mm size or you are talking about 65 mm size. So, whatever the size of the ballast which we are using, we need to see that they are perfectly within those permissible limits and even if there is a oversize or there is an undersize, in that case also the limits have been defined and this we have already discussed. So, this will also make a difference in terms of the stresses which are going to be induced. Now, another thing is the depth of the ballast section. If you remember when we discussed about the permanent way, we said the depth of the ballast section can be say 250 mm or 300 mm or 350 mm. And this is all dependent on what type of rail sections we are considering and we are talking about a broad grease section. So, the type of loads which will be there on the basis of that we have to see that what depth has to be provided, the depth should not be inadequate. So, this is important again. The type of a subgrade, now we are talking about the formation. The one which we had talked here, the formation level at this point, say this is a soil or maybe any, any other material can be there. So, is it a yielding formation, it is not a yielding formation or there are issues with the formation level itself in terms of uh, whether the compaction has been done in a perfect manner, good manner or not. So, what are the bearing capacity or the density which needs to be achieved here? So, this is the aspect which we have to look at. So, the material again, compaction, density and they will define that how much load can be taken up by this particular level. Pattern of distribution of load and stresses. As I have shown you at the back, usually we consider that if uh, this is a section then the load gets distributed at an angle of 45 degrees. So, whatever load comes here 
is getting distributed in this form and therefore if this is the depth of the cushion then this is also d and similarly on the other side this one is also d whereas at the center if we consider this as b width so this value will be b so this is how the load which was coming to an area of b and the unit length is now being changed to d plus b plus d so that is the size which is going to be there so it means now you have a much wider area on which this load has get getting distributed so the stresses which will be induced there they will be lower then the pressure on the sleeper is maximum at the center of its width and this pressure decreases from center towards the end. So, if we are talking about this then what happens is then this is the sleeper section and the rail is being placed at the top of it. They are both 90 degrees to each other. So, here when the load is coming this load is maximum at the center section this is what it says it is maximum at the center of the width and this pressure decreases from the center towards the end. So, here it is going to be maximum but when you come towards the down so here the effect will be very low so that is why. The vertical pressure under the sleeper is uniform at a depth which is approximately equal to the spacing of the sleepers. So, whatever is the spacing of the sleeper has been considered here. So, this is the spacing center to center spacing S. So, at a depth of S if we go down then we say that this vertical pressure is getting uniform and this is equal to the spacing of the sleeper. So, here one diagram has been given. In this diagram you can see that there are sleepers being provided. So, this is one two, three sleepers have been shown here. There is a load which is coming at the top on say sleeper 1 or sleeper 3. They are being placed at a spacing of S from center to center and at the bottom there is a ballast section and then finally there will be a formation level. What you see is some sort of bulbs being shown here and these bulbs they are known as pressure bulbs and what is the meaning of these pressure bulbs is that if you take any of the point on these bulbs or along this particular bulb then it will give you the same pressure value with respect to the load being applied. Say if we have marked one so this is showing the pressure value of 40 percent of the load which is coming at the top. But if you go up then this is going to increase and say just at the center of this load the effect is initially say as high as 160 and then there is an 100 and it goes down. But if we see in between the sleepers then the results are a bit different. Then what you found is this is 1, this is 10, this is 30. So, the pressures initially in this reason they will not be there they are going to be induced in the lower reasons here and this is because the the material which has been used here it's a ballast material and the loads which are coming on those so if there is a load which is coming on one of the aggregate and this aggregate is being supported by say three or four aggregates then the load is getting distributed to these four aggregates and similarly if uh, there are further aggregates which are likewise going further. So, what you found is that the load is further getting distributed. So, it means the area is continuously increasing and therefore, the, the stress condition is reducing. So, that is what is shown in this area and in another area because there is a way this dispersion is going to be there of the load because of that reason there will be some area where no stress is going to be induced. So, here at the bottom it says this is the center from center line of the middle sleeper. So, if uh, we consider here this is the middle sleeper. So, with that respect to this middle sleeper we are going this direction or the other direction. 
and here we are going down as a depth and that is how this pressure bulb has got created. Now talking to the formation, the one thing which we can do is the identification of the weak formations and for identification of the weak formations there are certain conditions which are being stipulated uh, by the Indian Railways. What are those? There are stretches having speed restrictions due to weak formation. If at certain area the speeds have been restricted, you may find that the speed is being restricted to even 30 kilometers per hour or even 20 kilometers per hour. So, this will be done because of some issue in the track. This issue may be pertaining to the rails which have worn out and needs a immediate replacement or this may also be related to the lower layers like in terms of sleepers, ballast and formation levels. So, there is a possibility that there is a weak formation and because of that weak formation the loads cannot be placed in a larger manner. So, what we do is the slowly the train moves therefore, the effect of those particular loads at the bottom will be lesser whereas in case of the train moving at a higher speed we have seen that whatever load is there that gets multiplied with the speed factor and that enhances it and we get a dynamic load. So, this is one thing. Another the stretches where more than normal track attention is required. Anything which has happened on a track and it is beyond the normal maintenance practices, it is beyond the normal inspection practices. Then in that particular track also there may be a possibility that we have a weak formation or the stretches where the ballast penetration profile is W shape and the maximum depth of penetration is more than 30 centimeters. So, the ballast section which is provided at the bottom, it happens that it goes in this form. So, there is a, a depression shot is being created. So, if this is happening and the value is penetration is more than uh, 30 centimeters which goes into the uh, formation level, then in that case uh, there is a problem here. Now, maximum formation pressure can be calculated using the formula P maximum is equals to 2 P s divided by pi d l multiplied with the fourth root of the ratio of u and 64 yi. Now, what are these things? The P is the line wheel load in tons. So, on one particular track whatever the loads are coming and what is the wheel load in that, that is what we are considering here. S is the sleeper spacing, D is the depth of the ballast under the sleeper. So, whatever the cushion is being provided that is depth we are considering. L is the effective length of the sleeper under one rail seat. And as I said previously here that under one rail seat the effective length of the sleeper is usually considered as half of the length of that particular sleeper or in some cases if it is say a monoblock sleeper in the case of uh, uh, concrete sleepers then that is the size of that monoblock is going to be the length there. U is the track modulus in kg per centimeter square and E and I again they are the characteristics values here. So, I is the moment of inertia of the worn out rail along the horizontal axis and E is the modulus of elasticity. So, we have the uh, material characteristics, we have the depth, we have the sleeper characteristics in terms of the spacing. So, all of these things have been taken together and on the basis of that we will be able to compute the value of the maximum formation pressure. Now, for permitting the new rolling stock, formation pressure exerted by WP locomotives at uh, 100 km per hour and box wagon at 75 km per hour on the broad gauge track and YP locomotives at 75 km per hour and boggy wagon at 50 km per hour on MG track that is meter gauge track these are taken as the permissible limits. So, we have two things up to this point. 
So what we see if it is a rolling stock, we are permitting that the formation pressure which is exerted by the WP locomotive at this speed or in the case of box wagon at a speed of 75 km per hour. This is one thing which we may consider if you are talking about a meter gauge track. Then here the locomotive is YP locomotive at a speed of 75 km per hour or the boggy wagon at a speed of 50 km per hour. Because of these particular loads which are coming actually these are giving you the load as well as the, uh, the speed factor. So that the load is getting transformed into a dynamic load. Then slightly higher value is taken in case of the motive power unit. So if you have a MU the multiple unit systems in those particular case slightly higher value will be there. Uh, if you look at this uh, diagram, uh, this gives you the maximum intensity of the soil pressure for a broad gauge track. Here on the uh, y axis we have the maximum intensity of the soil pressure in kg per centimeter square. On the x axis is the live wheel load in tons and then these different graphs which have been given in terms of the lines they relates to the specific condition of the track. Say the first one it talks about 75 hour rail with a sleeper density of m plus 4 and the ballast cushion of 200 mm. So if this is a type of a track being given to so this line is going to give you the maximum intensity of the soil pressure which will be coming for a given load. So if a given load is say 15 tons, so if you come here at this point and then go here, so that means 3.65 kg per centimeter square is the value. Similarly for other cases also it is being given. Now if we talk about the permissible values of the formation pressure, it is being taken as for a motive power unit for broad gauge it is 3.5 kg per centimeter square. In the case of a freight wagons on a broad gauge, it is 3 kg per centimeter square. So these are the values which are permissible. So any pressure which is coming at the formation level should be less than this. Let us look at one of the numerical here. So it is a, a broad gauge track with the, the load given as 13.25 tons, the spacing given as 83 centimeters, then depth of uh, the ballast cushion given as uh, 20 centimeters. The length of the sleeper is being given as 76 centimeters. Then uh, you have the track modulus of elastic track modulus as 300 kg per centimeter square. The modulus of uh, the, the uh, inertia that is 1440 cm4. Um, modulus of elasticity is 2.11 into 10 to the power 6 kg per centimeter square. So formation pressure is to be calculated. So the formation pressure was given was P. The formula was what? the 2 p s over pi d l into fourth root of u divided by 64 ei okay we can check it so this is 2 p s over pi d l and mu over 64 ei in fourth root of that so we are putting the values p is 13.25 tons so it has been converted to kg S is uh, 83 centimeters, D is uh, 20 centimeters and L is 76 centimeters, U is 300 kg per centimeter square, uh, E is uh, 2.11 into 10 to power 6 and I is 1440. So these values once we have put it comes out to be 2.89 kg per centimeter square. So this is less than uh, 3.5 kg per centimeter square which is a permissible value. So it is safe. So here certain values have been given for a different type of uh, subgrade soils. So if it is an alluvial soil then usually the bearing pressure is less than 0.7 kg per centimeter square. If it is soft clay then it ranges between 1.12 and 1.41 kg per centimeter square. If it is wet or loose sand then Again it is 1.12 to 1.41 kg per centimeter square dry clay for the farm sand then it increases to 1.48 to 2.11 and if it is compacted soils then this can be more than or equals to 2.88 kg per centimeter square. Now let us talk about the fish plate and the bolt hole. 
Here the maximum value permissible value for the dynamic stress range and for total stress they are taken as 25 kg per mm square and 30 kg per mm square respectively. So, dynamic stress range is here and the total stress is 30 kg per mm square and maximum permissible stress in the bolt hole is 27 kg per mm square. So, it means here what we are talking is that there is a rail section and then there is another rail section and this rail section has been attached or connected by using the fish plate and the fish bolts. So, here the values have been given. Again there is a graph already given for that. Here the stress in tons per centimeter square is given on the y axis and uh, uh, on the x axis it is a live wheel load in tons. This is for the fish plate uh, stresses for broad gauge and as we have seen previously all of these lines or graphs which are being provided they are for the track composition. For different track composition the values are being given. These have been given for both the total stress conditions as well as the dynamic stress conditions and depending on the situation we can very easily calculate or find out the value of the stress in the fish plate. Then this one is uh, related with the fish bolt hole. So, in the case of a fish bolt hole again for different uh, type of uh, rail sections these things are being given say this is for 52 kg or 90 r or 75 r rails for these three rails for different compositions. For the same condition on x axis we have the live load on the y axis we have the stress in tons per centimeter square. So, we will again be able to find out what are the stresses which are going to be uh, formed in the case of bolt holes for a given condition. So, this is very easier in this form can be done. Now, let us talk about the dynamic overload. Now, this is caused due to the diesel or the electric locomotives with smaller diameter wheels and higher up sprung masses. So, this is actually a problem here. So, when you are talking about a joint as I have shown you in the previous slide. So, there is a rail here and then there is another rail on this side. So, this is the joint we are talking and at this joint this can be a fish plate joint or it can be a welded joint and this is usually caused in the diesel and the electric locomotives where the unsprung masses that amount is also higher and these induces the faster deterioration of the track near the joint. The reason we have discussed again and again previously also the hitting which is possible at this point. If the joint is wider then this will create a issue here there is going to be a deterioration at this or this depending on the direction of travel if the direction of travel is there that. So, rail ends they are going to be deteriorated. This dynamic overload at a dipped rail joint, so this is a dipped rail joint which can be up to 12 mm on the main line track it is given by f is equals to f naught plus 0 0.1188 into v into under root of w. So, that much tons we are talking here where f naught is the static wheel load in tons, v is the speed in kilometers per hour and w is the unsprung masses per wheel in tons. So, if we put those values here what we are getting is the dynamic overload which is coming at this joint. The permissible values of the dynamic overloads has been given in the case of broad gauge locomotives it is 27 tons and for EMU stocks it is uh, 23 tons and for the coaches and the wagons this is 19 tons. So, the higher value is in the case of the equipments or the vehicles. Again one of the graph has been given wherein these values can be looked at. 
So, this talks about the various types of wagons or coaches which are available. It talks about their axle load. So, this is axle load. This is the type of say locomotive and then the unsprung masses these are given here. So, for any of such condition if you have a speed known then for these particular conditions which are again depicted here in the form of different type of graphs you can have a dynamic wheel load calculated or found out from this particular graph. Let us look at one of the numerical here. It is a WDM2 locomotive. The static wheel load is given as 9.4 tons because we talk about the axle load. So, in the case of axle load, this will be 18.8 tons and then half of that is coming on the wheel. The speed is 105 kilometers per hour. The sprung mass per wheel is 1.985 tons. So, we have to calculate the dynamic overload at the dip joint. The formula is F naught plus 0 0.1188 into V into under root of W. So, F naught is given as 9.4. The speed is given as 105 and unsprung masses that is being given as 1.985. So, when we put all of these things, this is comes out to be 26.97 tons. And in the case of a locomotive, broad gauge locomotive the value was 27 tons. So, therefore, it is less than 27. So, this is a permissible condition. So, there will not be an issue. If it is going beyond that, then the corrective measures needs to be taken. So, some permissible values of the different track stresses are given here. Banding stress in rails 36 kg per mm square. Contact stress between rail and wheel this is 21.6 kg per mm square then dynamic overload at rail joints due to the unsuspended or unsprung masses 27 tons for locos and 19 tons for wagons and formation pressure for the locos and for the wagons 3.5 and 3 kg per centimeter square in the case of fish plates and the bolts the stresses are 30 kg per mm square and 27 kg per mm square uh, respectively and minimum ultimate tensile strength is being taken here as 72 kg per mm square and the assumed yield point strength is being taken as, as 42.5 kg per mm square. So, these are all the permissible values which we need to take care of when we are designing the tracks. So, with this we close our discussion here. What we have discussed is the track stresses especially in the ballast and the formation as well as in the fish plates and the bolt holes. And then finally, towards the end, we discussed about the dynamic overload at the dipped joint. We will be discussing other aspects in the next lecture. Till then, thank you and bye.